today we will discuss signaling networks because all these pathways which we have discussed earlier in our class including the map kinase pathway ip3 dag pathway calcium signaling cyclic amp protein kinase b protein kinase a a protein kinase c pathways these are not operating alone in the cell they are forming some kind of networks they are crossing each other so so far we have discussed signaling in terms of linear pathways that transmit information from the environment to the intracellular targets so within the cell in the cell cytoplasm they are transmitting the signal from the environment of the cell so that the cell can respond accordingly however signaling from uh, signaling within the cell is far more complicated because all these pathways are crossing or controlling or regulating each other so that a uh, resultant signal transduction can happen inside the cell so first of all the activities of individual pathways are regulated by feedback loop so you need to align some things uh, some major so let me find something okay so so first of all they are having feedback loops means uh, these loops are maybe of two type either they are inhibiting they are inhibitory function or they are stimulatory function either they will stimulate the signaling or they will inhibit the signaling okay that control the extent and duration of signaling activity so two things will be controlled by these loops uh, first what is the extent how much the signaling is required and second most important is the duration so generally duration of uh, signaling is very important because if signaling is for very long periods of times so as we have studied it may lead to some kind of cancers for example uh, we have discussed ross sarcoma virus and other red sarcoma virus for example in addition signaling pathways do not operate in isolation so you should always remember you should you need to keep this into the, your mind so because these signaling pathways are not happening inside the cell in uh, isolation okay so they do not happening in isolation so therefore uh, because in the cell cytoplasm there is large traffic of proteins all these proteins are signaling proteins uh, means major a majority of them are signaling proteins so they interact with each other they controlling each other so therefore there is frequent cross talk between the different pathways so different pathways within the cell can uh, regulate each other they can influence each other so that intracellular signal transduction ultimately needs to be understood as an integrated network so uh, so this is very integrated network of uh, circuits generally they are not uh, simple uh, linear pathways they are branched integrated networks of connected pathways computational modeling can be used to uh, to to find out or uh, to to uh, think of or think about these kind of networks which are operating inside the cells uh, this is a major challenge though in cell biology to draw these uh, computational models uh, to draw these computational models to achieve this type of complexity using the computers which is actually happening inside the cell which will be necessary to understand the dynamic response of cells in their environment but because these signal because these computational models are required if you do not have these models so you cannot understand actually what is happening inside the cell because there is so many different type of signaling network signaling pathways which are intersecting each other which are influencing each other so therefore this complete networking models signal network models should be drawn so that you can uh, better understand what is happening actually how the regulation is exactly happening within the cell okay so this is necessary to understand the dynamic because the cell cytoplasm is a dynamic kind of thing because some proteins are synthesized some are uh, continuously degraded so this dynamic uh, anything is not fixed it is continuously changing and this changes in the response of cell when they are Uh, in different kind of environment so these environments are influencing the cell needs and the according to requirement different type of pathways are operated within the cell so one thing is now before starting this feedback mechanism of uh, 
uh, regulation of uh, signal transduction. Actually, this uh, this is NF kappa B pathway, which we have discussed in yesterday's class. If you do not remember, uh, let me show you something. Okay, so here. I hope it was. So it is here actually. Okay, so this is a signal molecule which is controlling this I kappa B kinase, which is a kind of inhibitory protein for this NF kappa B. This is a nuclear factor and this is inhibitory factor. So this inhibitory factor of kappa B protein uh, is having a regulatory kinase which will phosphorylate this protein specifically because it is made for this particular molecule I kappa B. Once it is phosphorylated, it is leading to some conformational change which allow the ubiquitin molecules to uh, attach to form poly, uh, polymers over these I kappa B proteins so that these can be degraded by ubiquitin mediated proteasomal degradation. Once this inhibitory protein is degraded, NF kappa B, which is a dimer, will go or translocate into your nucleus of the cell and will allow some of the target gene transcription. Now you need to understand how this pathway is being regulated using the feedback mechanism of regulation. So what is feedback? Feedback is anything which will form some of the proteins. Some of the genes are transcribed, which is forming some of the proteins. And these proteins are used for regulation of this kind of pathways. For example, something which is missed from the last, uh, from the previous diagram is this uh, thing actually. So this molecule, when translocated into the nucleus as a dimer, it will control some of the genes, and these gene include these genes include itself this inhibitory molecule that is I kappa B mRNA will be translated. Okay, so this transcription will happen. This molecule mRNA will be formed, and uh, when this mRNA is coming into the cytoplasm, the protein will form. And again, this inhibitory protein will bind to the dimers in the cytosol so that it will not allow these dimers to translocate inside the nucleus. And thus, this is an example of feedback inhibition. So this is uh, when uh, there is enough uh, uh, transcription of the targeted genes, I kappa B will again inhibit this particular complex, so it will not uh, be able to translocated into the nucleus and uh, will not allow the transcription of the targeted genes. This is an example of feedback mechanism of regulation of signaling pathway. So the activity of signaling pathway is controlled by this loops and one major kind of loop is called feedback loop. So we will also discuss crosstalks, but before discussing crosstalk, let me finish the feedback mechanism of regulation, which is illustrated very clearly in this particular diagram, which are similar in principle to feedback regulation of metabolic pathway. Just you have metabolic pathways, there is also that if there is an enzyme, if there is an intermediate which is not required, in the, for example, uh, in glycolysis, if pyruvate is already present in the cell, it is not required. So there are uh, certain inhibitory points in the pathway. For example, the first step itself where glucose 6 uh, uh, phosphatase, is, glucose 6 kinase is doing its function or some hexose kinase is doing its function will be inhibited. Similarly, in the signaling pathways, these kind of feedback loops are working which are meant to, to inhibit the signaling or this kind of uh, signal transduction, which are very similar to principle to the metabolic pathways. A uh, good example on active food, uh, this loop is provided by this pathway as we have discussed. NF kappa B is activated by signal that leads to the proteolysis of inhibitor that is I kappa B, inhibitor of kappa B. Okay, so uh, this is inhibitor. Uh, so this is uh, uh, inhibitory protein only allowing enough kappa B to translocate into the nucleus and when it is not there, it is degraded, only then it will go into the nucleus. It will uh, not only I kappa B or mRNA, it will also uh, enable some other molecules, other mRNA species to synthesize and uh, the, thus the proteins are formed. And one such protein or mRNA or the gene which is under regulation of this uh, kind of enough kappa B transcription factor is itself I kappa B, which is an inhibitor of this particular complex. So 
So all this has been discussed in this text and you can read this out so that you can better understand what is happening actually. So this regulation is critical because the extent and duration. So the two things we have, we were discussing. First thing is itna, how much the signaling is required. And the second thing, which is the most or uh, the uh, most important is the time duration for which signaling is actually happening. So it should be regulated. Otherwise it will lead to the unchecked proliferation of the cells or it will uh, continuously allow the proteins to form in the cells, which are of no use and may lead to the cancer or tumors. Okay. So this NF kappa B activity can determine the transcriptional response in the cell. For example, some target genes are induced by transient NF kappa B activity. This is very transient for, uh, for some time only. Sorry. This is transient and it will allow only uh, for 30 to 60 minutes. Once this time is achieved, enough genes are transcribed and this I kappa B mRNA meanwhile will uh, be translated and forming this I kappa B protein which will inhibit this particular complex so that it will not uh, further uh, translocate it inside the nucleus and thus the signaling is over. So this is called feedback mechanism or feedback loop where some of the metabolites are controlling their own inhibitors or, or once their inhibitors are formed, they will inhibit the signal transduction pathway. Now the signaling by uh, MAP kinase provide another example of importance of duration of the signaling. So second thing is the MAP kinase pathway. We also have discussed this MAP kinase pathway where RAS protein is controlling RAF, RAF uh, is controlling MAC protein, MEK, and then it is controlling some MAP kinase or ERK. So provides another example of this time of this duration is very important because each kinase is a kinase for the next uh, downstream molecule in the MAP kinase pathway. So uh, in a well-studied model of cell differentiation and the response to the nerve growth factor. So this we have discussed actually uh, this, this kind of uh, growth factors, whether it is nerve growth factor, epidermal growth factor, or platelet derived growth factor, or it, uh, insulin itself, all are doing signaling via uh, the receptor tyrosine kinases or uh, one of the receptor tyrosine kinase signaling way is via these MAP kinase pathways. So can lead either to the cell proliferation or neuronal differentiation when this nerve growth factor is being uh, utilized as a growth, as a signal or primary messenger. So uh, depending upon the duration of ERK activity, now this duration is very important because uh, it is transient, okay? So this duration is important. It is required activation of MAP kinase for uh, only for half to one hour, okay, for 30 to 60 minutes only. And once this particular pathway is over, this will lead to the differentiation and proliferation of nerve cells. But suppose if uh, it is not for the half hour or one hour uh, or so, if it is continuous activation of this MAP kinase pathway for two to three hours, now what can happen uh, induces differential uh, differentiation of nerve growth factor treated cells into the neurons. So the other cells also, which are treated with the nerve growth factor, whether it is any type of cells will be differentiated in the neurons. Okay, so, so this signaling, this duration is important. So, uh, okay, so you need to remember this. Now there is another mechanism of regulation that is called crosstalk. Crosstalk is anything which is happening between two different type of pathways. Suppose there are two linear pathways. Uh, so the interaction of one signaling pathway with the another, uh, interaction of one signaling pathway with the another is called crosstalk. So that a uh, similar way as the two students can talk to each other, the two pathways or two signaling networks, two signaling linear pathways can uh, talk to each other. So this is called crosstalk if they are interacting, their proteins are interacting with each other. Okay, several examples, there are several examples as we have started. Uh, okay, one major example, I also uh, told you that this calcium and cyclic EMP signaling are uh, crossing each other because they are activating, they can activate the same transcription factor that is called CRAB actually. 
So this cyclic EMP is activating one uh, uh, protein kinase that is called protein kinase A, and this calcium is activating another protein kinase that is called protein kinase C. But both the kinase are serine theriumine kinases, so they can uh, activate the similar transcription factors. And here the transcription factor is called CREB, C R E B, cyclic EMP response element binding protein in the nucleus, so that the same result will uh, happen between the cyclic AMP and ERK pathways, for example, or between the ERK or TGF beta SMAD pathways, which we have discussed uh, yesterday. So this MAP kinase pathway can cross talk with these TGF beta SMAD pathway proteins and between integrin signaling and these receptor tyrosine kinases. So many, many different types of pathways which are linear in nature can cross talk to uh, each other. So uh, influencing each other's so now see some of the models, a novel example uh, is given here. For example, uh, see this. This is the example of crosstalk, which is being illustrated with the help of uh, G protein. So this is a, some G protein. So this G protein is, ha uh, sorry, this is GPCR actually. It is having some G protein and G protein is trimeric G protein here, which is having three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. Beta, gamma is forming a complex, alpha is free. So it can be activated, okay? So it can be activated when uh, and beta gamma will be separate and this activate in response to GTP binding. Okay, so one hormone will come and activate this in such a way that this alpha subunit and uh, or in some cases because we have discussed four families of G proteins where this beta gamma can influence some of the ion channels directly. And this is influencing many, many enzymes, for example, guanyl cyclase, uh, adenyl cyclase, uh, phosphodiesterase. Okay, so this we have discussed. Another, uh, another way of regulation is this in the presence of GRK, which are the G receptor uh, kinases. So these G receptor or GPCR receptor kinases, uh, because they are very specific for these proteins, GPCRs, so they will phosphorylate because they are kinases, they will phosphorylate the G pro, uh, GPCR uh, molecules so that they will create, uh, there is a conformational change and it will uh, create some sites where the beta resting proteins will come and bind actually. This we have discussed, okay. Now these beta resting proteins can, uh, will not allow the interaction of these pathways. This ERK is MAP kinase, like MAC, RAF. Actually, these uh, beta restins are forming the scaffolds. Uh, for, they will work as a scaffold protein where different uh, kinases of MAP kinase pathway will interact with each other, okay? So, and this beta restin will not allow the interaction, direct interaction between the G proteins or these pathways. So, one scaffold protein we also have discussed in uh, the text earlier that is called some GIP, I think. So let me show you one more scaffold protein, which we have already discussed. This is called GIP1, which is a scaffold protein so that the many, many components of the one signaling pathway can uh, be uh, hold together in close proximity so that they can be activated one after the other. So the uh, distinct scaffold protein are involved not only in the organization of other MAP kinases. So they, this is organization is uh, done with the help of these scaffold proteins so that different kinases or different proteins which are part of the same signaling pathway can come in the close proximity so that they can function uh, efficiently. As a result, this, uh, this uh, specificity is determined of a signaling pathway within the cell because all the components are belonging to the same uh, signaling pathway. So this will lead to the specificity and high efficiency when these scaffold proteins are uh, holding all the components of the same signaling pathway. Similarly, this beta restin can also, because this is beta restin and this is uncoupling these G proteins from this receptor after phosphorylation of the receptor, this will also uh, act as a scaffold protein for the MAP kinase components, okay? And thus they are linking because this is not only inhibiting the alpha protein from the interaction, they are linking this GPCR with MAP kinase because generally this MAP kinase is happening uh, downstream of receptor tyrosine kinases. But here you can see this GPCR 
uh, and these uh, map kinase pathway components are in the close proximity and this beta arrestin is working as a scaffold so that all the components are at the same place and thus they can be activated more efficiently. So, so all these things have been written here. They also act as a signaling molecules themselves to stimulate additional downstream pathway molecules, uh, including non-receptor tyrosine kinases, as we have discussed yesterday, one of the SRC family members, MAP kinase pathway members, uh, these, uh, okay, RAS, RAF, MAC, ERK. In particular, beta arrestin 2 serves as this is a specific uh, sub, uh, subspecies of beta arrestin family, beta arrestin 2. It is serving as a scaffold protein for this, all these uh, MAP kinase path, signaling pathways, components directly linking this MAP kinase pathway to the GPCRs. Okay, so this you can, uh, okay, this you can underline. Now, Now, if you have, uh, so this was an example of crosstalk where GPCR generally do not interact with uh, MAP kinase components, but crosstalk is something in which different, different pathways can interact with each other. So the GPCR is able to transmit signal using MAP kinase pathway. So this is example of crosstalk. So we have discussed feedback loops, we have discussed crosstalks, now they, these uh, are forming some kind of networks of cellular signal transduction. These may be of five major types. One is called negative feedback where the end component will come and inhibit the first component. Uh, okay, so this is called negative feedback. If the last component is coming and uh, stimulating the first component so that the signal pathway will run again and again, this is a positive feedback mechanism. So the feedback can be, uh, of two type, either positive or negative feedback. Crosstalk is also of two type, one is stimulatory, one is inhibitory, because there are two different pathways and components of two pathways are influencing each other. So either they are stimulating each, uh, other pathway component or they are inhibiting other pathway proteins or components. Therefore, they are either stimulatory or inhibitory crosstalks. One major thing between these two different types of feedback and crosstalk uh, uh, pathways this is called feed forward relay in which either this component will go stepwise and will influence the last component or it may be directly converted into the last component. So this can also happen in the signaling networks. The extensive crosstalk between the individual signal transduction pathways means that multiple pathways interact with one another to form a signaling network. So network only forms when different different components or different pathways are interacting with each other. Some of the ways in which the, these pathways can connect with the network are illustrated in this particular figure. The junctions between these different pathways uh, can be either positive or negative. So where they are inhibiting is called negative, where they are stimulating is called positive. In addition to the negative feedback loop, signaling networks can contain positive feedback loop uh, or the feed forward relay systems where so you need to uh, note this, what is feed forward relay, because this is a completely different class of, uh, okay, so feed forward relay is something in which activity of one component of a pathway stimulate a distant downstreaming component. So suppose in the last case, as we have discussed, uh, in which the one component of a pathway stimulate a distant downstream component of the same pathway. So see here, in this feed forward relay, this component, which is a part of this pathway, can influence either this or this, which are distant to uh, distant signaling components of this pathway. So this is called as feed forward relay. It is generally stimulate, uh, stimulative in nature or positive feed forward relays. Uh, Kind of positive thing where it is always in influencing the component positive way so that it can the pathway can proceed with a higher pace or higher rate. Now, if we have all these understanding of the signaling uh, cell signaling 
or we need to understand the cell signal in detail, we acquire a signaling, we need to require the development of network models and these network models should be either mathematically uh, drawn or with the help of some computational program. So that predict the dynamic behavior of interconnected signaling pathways that uh, ultimately result in the biological response. Because the biological response is such a thing which is influenced by so many different components of different different signaling pathways. So therefore, to understand the complete biological response, we need to understand, we require uh, to develop the network models. So one network model is as shown in this particular diagram. So this is very complex actually, where, where all the pathways are, these lines are uh, linear pathways and the crosses are showing how they are interacting with each other. So if you uh, visualize the networking or the cellular networks or the cell signaling within a cell, so this is actually happening. Uh, so it is not uh, like the single pathway is uh, regulating itself or happening in the cell. There are many, many different types of pathways which are controlling each other and influencing each other. So, okay, so uh, there are transcription machinery, translation machinery, secretion apparatus, motility uh, machinery, which is helping the cell to move from one place to other. Uh, okay, to so change in shape, electrical responses in ion channels, membrane proteins, and so many things are operating simultaneously. So this particular mammalian signaling network, so this is an example of network, and this is uh, of the mammalian neurons in which uh, there are 545 signaling elements in the uh, mammalian neurons are shown. And there are three types of arrows which are depicting it very correctly. One is called green arrows, which are stimulatory in nature, which are influencing each other positively. Red arrows, which are inhibitory. So these are inhibitory. Uh, so there are, you can see majority of them are inhibitory, okay. And there are blue arrows. Blue means there are neutral links. They are not influencing each other. They are not inhibiting or stimulating, but they are neutral. So this kind of things overall result in the change in behavior whenever there is a change in environment of a cell okay so so this uh, this ends your uh, cell signaling chapter of from the cooper so okay so and one more thing which we need to cover in today's class uh, okay so in today's class we have discussed the feedback mechanism crosstalks how these uh, pathways are uh, interacting with each other to make very complex networks inside the cell in which the three types of interaction can happen sim simultaneously, either stimulatory, inhibitory, or neutral uh, type of interactions. And we know uh, so many things are uh, happening inside the cell simultaneously. For example, translation machinery is uh, continuously synthesizing mRNA. Our translation machinery is uh, synthesizing proteins. Secretion apparatus is for to secrete the vesicles out of the cell. Okay, so many things are happening uh, simultaneously. So it is very complex kind of model. These type of mathematical models or computational models are required to fully understand the signaling or the signal transduction. Uh, okay, to understand in more details. Now, the eukaryotic systems generally we have studied uh, in which there is complex things happening. But if we discuss the prokaryotic cells or bacteria, they are very simple kind of things where they are unicellular, they are, they are not having so many complex networks inside their cells. They are very simple uh, structures and very simple kind of things are happening inside the cell cytosol. So if, uh, uh, so, the, so the interaction, so the movement of organism in a specific direction in response to a chemical stimulus is called chemotaxis. So the so similar things can happen in response to the light or other type of signals, but if there is a chemical stimulus, so this is called chemotaxis, the cell will move towards the uh, high uh, gradient of uh, the food or nutrient. Chemotaxis in bacteria depend upon a signaling pathway that terminate at the flagellar motor. Now we need to understand many things before going into the details. 
So this first paragraph is actually the portion of microbiology. And uh, actually the second paragraph from where the bacterial chemotaxis is mediated by transmembrane receptor and all these things were discussed is actually part of signal transduction class. Okay, but okay, for your understanding, I will let you know about these components of uh, flagellar motor, what are what type of proteins are involved, how this is happening. And then I will uh, let you come to signal transduction in bacterial cells. So this type of signaling in bacteria is called two component signaling systems because there is two kinds of proteins which are doing all these functions, all these signal, signals, uh, signal transduction in bacteria. So this is called, one is called sensor and the other protein is called response regulator. So sensor is some kind of histidine kinase and response regulator is some kind of aspartate, okay, containing. So D is for aspartate, H is for histidine. So when I was on this particular page, sorry, I do not know whether it is in this. I hope this was part of this PDF only. So when we were discussing these four kind of Oh, sorry, actually, this is not in the same PDF. It was some No problem. So actually, three major type of amino acids which are going under phosphorylation are serine, therine, and tyrosine, which are generally uh, controlling the signal transduction in eukaryotes. But in prokaryotes, as I told you in previous classes, these are either uh, histidine kinases or some aspartate kinases. So, okay. So first of all, this histidine is being phosphorylated. Histidine ke upar phosphate group add ho jayega. Ye aayega kahan se? ATP se hi aayega. The gamma phosphate will be transferred to the histidine and then this will be transferred to the S part eight of another protein that is called response regulator. So let us finish it quickly so that we can move to other section. So the two component signaling system is the most common form of signaling pathway that is actually happening in the bacteria and also in the plants. This is called canonical two component system. So you need to remember some terms which will come in this text, uh, which are important. So this is canonical two component systems. Uh, in bacteria, if we talk about, these are made up of two proteins. One is called sensor and one is called uh, sensor that is has an autophosphorylating histidine kinase. So this is having a histidine kinase, which will phosphorylate the histidine residue in this particular uh, kinase. So this is autophosphorylated. Auto means itself it will be phosphorylated. Okay, so this is an integral component. It's called histidine kinase, which will phosphorylate one of the specific histidine in this particular sensor molecule. And a response regulator, which, will, uh, which transfers the phosphate from the sensor kinase to a conserved aspartate uh, within itself. So the second protein is called a response regulator, which is having a specific aspartate uh, amino acid to which this particular phosphate is being transferred via the, the kinase domain of this particle. <clears throat> so remember, this is not kinase actually. So because uh, kinases are generally the enzymes which will transfer the phosphate from the ATP. But if it is transferring from one, phos one substrate to other substrate, these are, uh, these are phosphotransferases, okay? Now, the sensor histidine kinase is located in the membrane. Okay, so I need to show you diagram now. Let us move to the next page. So see this, this is, so this sensor is a part of integral part of the membrane. So uh, this is a transmembrane section. Uh, located in the membrane, it can be activated by binding of a ligand that will come and uh, will bind to the extracellular medium, uh, extracellular, extracellular phase of the cell. 
activation causes the kinase to autophosphorylate over this histidine residue. The reaction transfers the phosphate from ATP to the histidine residue uh, in the kinase domain. So this kinase is, ha is having a histidine uh, in uh, itself and it will transmit uh, it, uh, one gamma phosphate will be transferred from the ATP over this histidine molecule. Fine. Okay. So, the reaction transfers the phosphate from the ATP to this particular residue in this kinase domain. The sensor interacts with the effector protein that is response regulator. Uh, it will go and interact with the second protein that is the response regulator. The response regulator has two domains. One is conserved receiver domain and one is effector domain. So this is receiver domain, this is effector domain. So this receiver domain is having one aspartate, specific aspartate, to which this phosphate group will be transferred and this effector domain will be activated in this response and there is a conformational change in the protein. Uh, histidine to the sensor, uh, in the sensor to the aspartic acid residue in the, uh, its own domain, so it will transfer this uh, phosphate residue. Uh, this activates the effector domain. Uh, okay, so this uh, usual end target of the two component pathway is the regulation of the gene transcription. So obviously there is some genes so that this effector then going to regulate some of the genes which are under its, con uh, under its regulation. So this is very simple two component system which is present in both plants as well as bacteria. Now, how this two signaling system, two component system is going to influence the movement of bacteria. So we will discuss in this particular text. So the movement of the bacteria or organism in a specific direction in the response of chemical stimulus is called chemotaxis. As we have discussed, this chemotaxis depend upon the signaling pathway, which is a simple two component pathway in bacteria that terminate at the flagellar motor. So the effector protein will control uh, the flagellar motor. So the flagella, which is a moving appendage in this particular bacteria. So first of all, you should understand what are the major differences between this uh, flagella. If we talk in terms of bacteria and eukaryotes. So in bacteria, these flagella are smaller and simpler in structure, whereas eukaryotic flagella are complex and they are uh, having Okay, size is big. They are larger than these prokaryotic flagella. They are made up of protein flagellin in bacteria, whereas in case of eukaryotes, these flagella are made up of tubulin protein microtubules, and the microtubules are having nine plus two arrangement, as I will as I will show you that in this particular diagram it is shown that. Okay, so suppose this is your eukaryotic flagella, so they are having nine plus two arrangement. So one direct question has been asked in a previous year, uh, I do not know what is the year exactly, but uh, in CSIR where they have asked about this particular protein that is Nexin. So you need to remember the protein components of these uh, eukaryotic flagella also, which are important. So they can be asked uh, directly. So this is called Nexin, which is connecting two uh, microtubules together. They are having nine plus two arrangement. These are nine, these are two plus two central microtubules and these are dynein arms where the protein which is a red colored thread here which is connecting the two microtubules together are called uh, nexin whereas these green colored uh, which are interacting with the central microtubule these are called radial spokes okay and rest these are made up of alpha and beta or a and b tubules so they are doublet in nature so this is all about eukaryotic flagella now we need to discuss prokaryotic flagella in this particular class because we are discussing signal transduction in prokaryotes. Now, based on these flagella, which are present in the cell and bacterial cells, uh, they can be monotrichous, atrichous. Atrichous means if there is no flagella at all. If there is monotrichous, there is only one flagella. Amphitrichous, if there is uh, on the both sides, there are either one flagella or more than one flagella on the both ends of a cell. These are uh, amphi, 
low for low for is a bunch of uh, flagella over a cell it is called low for trichus so the examples are also given here monotrichus is vibrio cholerae which are the causative agent of cholera are monotrichus okay this bacilli formis is an example of low for trichus then there is amphitrichus because they are having a bunch of flagella uh, over their both the ends these are uh, spirillum uh, serpens for example are the amphitrichus Uh, bacteria. Then there is peritrichus. So the uh, most important and the simplest example is E. coli. Trishla is asking: Does radial spokes stay binded to the central microtubules? Uh, yes, they are interacting. So as you can see in this particular diagram. so these are uh, radial spokes and they are interacting with the central microtubule so that they are stabilizing the overall structure of the uh, flagella in eukaryotes so they are interacting with the central microtubule okay if you are asking something different i do not know but yes they are interacting okay so in okay so one more thing uh, beside this because we have seen these are made up of 9 plus 2 arrangement they are complex than uh, bacterial flagella one major difference between these two flagella uh, is in the bacteria they are having rotatory movements so the flagella will move like this either clockwise or anti clockwise so these two type of movements will allow the bacteria to either run or tumble what is run and tumble i will show you so whenever there is a movement okay actually it is not a, okay so for clearance actually it is not shown very a test but yes they are interacting you can find some better better uh, diagrams uh, from the net okay so where they are shown like proteins but here they are shown as dots so they are not very clearly depicting the actual interaction so now i will show you two type of movements one is called run run is something when the bacteria will move in a straight line and then there is tumble tumble is something when a bacteria will stop moving it will change its direction and this direction change in direction is random if there is no no nutrient so after change it will again run so run tumble run tumble okay so the bacteria will move like this okay so the straight line is called run and the change in direction is called tumble so these two type of movements are generally seen in case of uh, a bacteria so okay so this is run this is tumble this is run then tumble run so this will happen actually this is helping the bacteria so that it can avoid from predators because while it is changing its direction it is very random predator do not know in which direction it is uh, it is going in next time so suppose it is going this way this is tumble again tumbling again so the change in direction uh, okay so then there is run so okay so it is unexpected run and uh, tumbles allow the bacteria to remain away from the predator so that uh, it cannot be predicted so more clearly actually this is uh, not a straight line but the bacteria generally move in a straight line so let me draw it again for you so i need a straight line actually so generally this is run this then there is tumble oh sorry this is not moving actually hope you are able to understand what i want to uh, told you okay so this is run this is tumble again run tumble this kind of now you need to understand uh, this how it is happening so whenever there is anti clockwise movement anti clockwise is in this direction when this flagella will move uh, like this way okay it will anti clockwise so in anti clockwise motion bacteria generally are showing this kind of movement this is called run this straight lines are called run okay so uh, depending upon how much uh, duration it is moving this run it may be of short duration or long duration okay but this straight line is called run it is a result of anti clockwise rotation of this flagella whereas now you can uh, expect this this clockwise movement as shown in this particular diagram this is clockwise so this clockwise movement allow the bacteria to change its direction so at these points okay so the points which are shown in this particular diagram 
for example this point okay this point they are tumbling okay so this tumble is a result of clockwise movement of the flagella so if the flagella will move in this direction this cell will tumble now this is a result of uh, uh, signal transduction so signal transduction is controlling each uh, motion of the this flagella so today we will discuss how this is actually in the control of the cell actually whereas the second thing which i wanted to tell you in eukaryotes this type of movement is generally not present uh, these are not rotatory in eukaryotes whereas uh, have you seen the uh, whiplash kind of movement so they will move like this okay whereas they are having these rotatory motions like motor but whiplash flagella are like uh, you have seen the boats old boats okay where uh, there are to move the boat actually we need to uh, to hindi mein usko kuch bolte hain chappu okay so these are the kind of whiplash kind of motion so it will move like this okay these are not rotatory movements so this difference is very important between prokaryotes and eukaryotes second thing is in uh, prokaryote this movement is proton driven so h positive ions are going to control this i will tell you how this h positive ions are being transferred inside the bacterial cell uh, whereas in eukaryotes this atp is doing uh, every aspect of this uh, flagellar movements so okay after discussing all these differences hope these uh, will help you to uh, understand the topic in more details now this we have discussed this also we have discussed run is a result of counter clockwise movement of uh, uh, rotation of the uh, bacterial flagella while tumble is a result of clockwise respectively uh, okay this we have discussed now we are coming to bacterial flagella so because uh we need to discuss this in detail to understand the cell signaling so before starting this actually i want to tell you some about some proteins so membrane proteins that is called motor protein a mot a and motor protein b that is mot b along with some flagellin proteins that is flagellin g create a proton channel that drives the rotation as we have seen from the previous table or diagram these protons are going to help the flagella to uh, in a move movement or in the motion okay so this motor like movements of these flagella are a result of these proton channels okay these proton gradients that drives the rotation of the flagella so now we will look for these motor proteins motor a and motor b and flag and these flagellin protein g in the cell okay so we are moving to this now you can see that there are four type of rings which are actually uh, they are in the bacterial systems these are called l ring p ring there is an ms ring l4 uh, this is the outer membrane ring is called l ring uh, there is a ring called p ring which is present in the plasma membrane then uh, sorry in the papilloglycan layer actually there is a c ring in the cytosol and there is a ms ring in the in the okay membrane actually this is in the membrane this is in the papilloglycan layer so these four ring systems are present then there is a stator and one is rotor so you can see this is a motor this is a rotor and this rotor is directly linked to your flagella of the bacterial flagella and this rotor is going to move but there is a stator this stator is made up of two type of proteins one is called motor a protein this is called motor b protein so uh, <clears throat> we will move to another diagram so that you can clearly understand what is actually happening so as you can see from this particular diagram there are four rings l ring p ring p is in the papilloglycan s ring is in the endo membrane or the and this is ms ring which because this ring is uh, linked actually and there is a c ring in the cytoplasm so Uh, inner membrane and uh, this ring are connected so this is an ms ring now this is not our topic of interest we are going to discuss about this motor proteins and the fly g protein so see here this is fly g protein and this is motor a protein complete and this is uh, this pink color section is motor b protein so these are creating a kind of channel through which protons are moving from this side towards the cytosol so here here is positive charge because there is more uh, uh, 
uh, uh, H positive ions in this particular uh, space, periplasmic space, this is called periplasmic space, this uh, low peptidoglycan and inner membrane in between these two layers. And this is negatively charged cytosolic uh, side is negatively charged. So the proton will move from this side towards this side from motor B to motor A protein and through this fly G protein. So see this, these are H positive ions which are very high concentration in this periplasmic space. So this is the periplasm. Now these are acting like stator proteins because this is motor B, this is motor A protein. Uh, oh sorry, this is motor B. Small is motor B and large is motor A protein and there is fly G protein. So these are acting like channels through which H positive ions are moving from high concentration towards their low concentration. So you can see the charge here. So this is periplasm where these peptidoglycan layers is present. So uh, these channels of uh, H positive ions through the motor proteins will allow the, the change in gradient. So this is positively charged periplasm, whereas this cytosol is negatively charged. So the protons will move from high concentration towards the low concentration of air. Hope this is very clear from these diagrams. Now we will move to the cell signaling. So everything is written in the text actually. So these two proteins and fly G is creating a proton channel and this is helping the flagella to move the move, not move actually, to rotate. So the rotation of flagella can be clockwise or counterclockwise. When the flagella rotate clockwise, it will tumble. Whereas the counterclockwise rotation will lead to the uh, run or the forward motion of this particular bacteria. In the absence of chemical gradient, suppose if there is no nutrient or uh, chemical signal, so the bacteria, for example, E. coli move to a random fashion. So there is very random kind of movement. So bacteria can move in any direction, which is very unexpected. So the predator is unable to predict in which direction the bacteria is going to move. Okay, so this is random kind of movement. But suppose here there is a bacteria and at some distance there is a signal, means from here it is some nutrient for example and this is sensing the nutrient. So the concentration of nutrient is increasing in this particular direction so that this cell will try to move uh, in this response of this signal. So this is called chemotexis when there is a chemical signal, so the cell will move. This is a bacterial cell, this is a nutrient. The cell will move towards the high concentration of the nutrient. Then uh, it is not random kind of movements. This has become directional. So there is a change in, uh, in behavior of the bacterial cell whenever there is a signal or there are some chemotexes happening in the bacterial cell. So include runs and tumbles where the cell swim forward tumbles when the cell will stop moving. Uh, following a tumble, the direction of the next run is very random in absence of nutrient. However, if the gradient of the nutrient of a chemical attractant is present, these random movement become biased. So that there is a direction will be. Uh, so suppose if you are not having any aim. Okay, so suppose there is a uh, random classes. So either you will join the class or you will not join the class, but because we are uh, discussing cell signaling from last few days. So you are very uh, biased means you know already that we are going to study the cell signaling in today's class also. And because this is the last class, so I will try to finish this as early as possible so that we can start some new topic because I know this is uh, irritating you again and again. Okay. So as the bacterial uh, bacterium senses that it is moving towards the higher concentration of the attractant, so the run become longer. How the bacteria is able to manage the direction of uh, its uh, towards the high concentration of new nutrients, so the run become longer and tumble is less frequent. So suppose if a bacterial cell is moving, if there is long runs and the tumble is very uh, less, okay, so it is moving in a single direction. So very less tumbling. So it will give some kind of direction to the bacteria so that it can move from this pole point to the high concentration of nutrient. So this is kind of biased movement or you can say it is a directional movement towards the uh, high concentration of uh, attractant that is called chemotaxis. If the bacterium is sensing a repellent, for example, some toxin, the same general mechanism will apply Okay, so the bacteria in this case will move in the uh, opposite direction. It will, uh, the run will be longer 
but it will be in the opposite direction. So towards the nutrient and away from the toxin. So this kind of movement will be seen uh, when there is a toxin or repellent. Although in this case, the decrease in concentration of repellent that promotes the run. So one thing that is nutrient is allowing the movement towards the higher concentration. If there is a repellent or toxin, uh, the bacterial cell will move towards the decreased concentration. Okay, so that it can move away from that particular toxin or harmful chemical or the that type. So here it is shown that, uh, uh, okay, so now it is clear that uh, the two type of movement that is called chemotaxis can be either towards the nutrient or away from the repellent or toxin. So it is basically the same but opposite thing. So obviously it will, uh, it will be based upon some kind of same kind of signaling. So, okay. So this signaling is shown in the response of some toxin or repellent. So this toxin will bind to this receptor that is called chemotaxis receptor. It is very simple terminologies which are being used in this case because, you know, bacteria are very simple and these are single cellular, uh, single celled organisms and more and more simpler than eukaryotes. So the signaling is also very simple. Now we will discuss in detail what is actually happening. So this is the topic of today's class and uh, we will discuss in detail. So, first of all, there are certain proteins you need to remember. I will uh, tell you some of the tricks to remember them. So, if there is W, uh, this is called chemical or chemotaxis protein W. So, chemotaxis CHE and this is W, W for something you can write here uh, was. Okay, so it mean you can simply also rewrite it as WAS, but I have written it as WAAS because it will give you the clear meaning of this particular uh, component of the cell signaling. So this W or the chemotaxis protein W is having some adapter role. So this is a kind of adapter. Okay. Then there is a second A, which is showing the chemotaxis protein A which is a kind of sensor. So you can get it. The meaning of this was this W or CHEW is an adapter, whereas the other protein, chemotaxis protein A, is a sensor. So the two proteins are interacting with each other. Now you are familiar with the adapters. Adapters are kind of proteins which are interacting with the two proteins, which allow the two proteins to interact with each other. So if they are an adapter, they are linking this receptor with these sensors. So the main protein which is responsible for signaling is this A. So therefore I write it as 2A. So one is for adapter, one is for chemotaxis protein A. So the main protein is a sensor protein. As we have discussed in two component system, there is one sensor and there is one uh, uh, receptor. One is other protein that is called So this is called, sorry, response regulated protein. So this is a sensor. So we will write the terminology so that it will not confuse us later. So this is the adapter. Adapter is having some function which will allow the two protein to interact with each other. Then there is another protein. This is called sensor. Sensor will sense the uh, signal and sensor is having some domain as we have discussed from the previous diagram, which is having some histidine here. So if you write histidine here, it will not be incorrect. So this is having some histidine and this histidine will be phosphorylated. So now this chemotaxis protein A is, uh, is the initial protein. So it is the main protein uh, is the first letter of alphabet. So A is something from where the signal is actually proceeded further. So downstream. Then there is a protein called chemotaxis protein Y. Now what is the function of Y? Y will uh, response regulator because we have seen from the previous discussion then they, that there is two type of proteins. One is called sensor, one is called response regulator. Adapter is not having any function. It is only linking these two proteins. But these two proteins are main. One is A, one is Y. And one is Z, which is removing this phosphorylation. So you can say these two proteins are main proteins of this particular signaling. This is called response regulator. And you know response regulator is having some uh, amino acid that is called aspartate from where, uh, from the histidine actually, this phosphate is being transferred over this response regulator. 
response regulator is having two domains one is called uh, one is called as uh, uh, two domains one is receiver domain and one is effector domain so this phosphate will be removed and this key, uh, this will be inactive again if this is phosphorylated is it will uh, control your flagellar movements so now we will see what is actually happening in this particular text so let me remove all this so that we can move the space okay Okay, so in the absence of a chemical gradient, bacteria, for example, E. coli move to the random fashion. This we have already discussed. So now, bacterial chemotaxis is mediated by a transmembrane receptor and the phosphorylate, uh, this is called phosphorylation relay system because the phosphorylation is being transferred from histidine over the aspartate of response regulator Y. Okay. So it depends upon a two component signaling pathway activated by histidine kinase associated receptor. The chemotaxis receptor are methylated during adaptation. So now this we have discussed also, what is adaptation? Adaptation is something, uh, there is two type of responses. One is adaptation, one is down regulation. So adaptation is if there is a repeated signaling. So there is more signal, uh, signal molecules. The concentration of signal is very high. So that uh, the, uh, the receptor will be undergoing adaptation. So they will be desensitized or they will not uh, respond to the signal molecule. So the adaptation is kind of response when these, force, these uh, receptors are methylated. So some of the methyl groups are over, added over these receptors. So they are undergoing adaptations. So they are called methyl accepting chemotaxis proteins. So you can write this MCP here because they are methyl uh, accepting chemotaxis proteins, these receptors actually. So these are MCPs. So this is methyl accepting chemotaxis proteins, so MCPs. Why these are MCPs? Because these can be, uh, in when they are adapt under adaptation, they can be methylated. The methyl groups or CS3 groups will be added over them so that signal molecule or the, the uh, repellent or any other nutrient is no longer able to bind to these receptors and doing this signal transduction event, okay? So this is called adaptation. So these are MCPs. The phosphorylation relay system enable the chemotaxis receptor to control the flagellar motors. How these are controlling in E. coli binding of a repellent, for example, increases the activity of the receptor, uh, which is in uh, this adapter protein W and the sensor protein A acting as a histidine kinase because it is having a histidine to which the phosphate group is added from the ATP molecule, thereby stimulating this uh, uh, sensor protein to phosphorylate itself over the histidine. This sensor protein quickly transfers covalently bound high energy phosphate directly to the aspartate of some response regulator protein that is called chemotaxis Y protein to generate a chemotaxis Y phosphate molecule. The phosphorylated uh, uh, receptor, uh, this is called a regulator or uh, response regulator. This phosphorylated response regulator dissociates from the receptor and diffuses through the cytosol bind to the flagellar motor and causes uh, it to, to rotate clockwise. And if it is uh, rotating it clockwise, it is going to tumble, means it will stop the cell from moving so that the cell can change its direction. A phosphorylated state, uh, okay, so thus, if it will stop the cell from tumbling, obviously uh, it will lead to the long runs so that the cell will either move away from the replant or towards the nutrient. This is very simple strategy, actually, if you are able to understand this. So this uh, chemotaxis Y protein will be dissociated from the receptor and it will diffuse through the cytosol bind to the flagellar motor and it is causing the cell to rotate, uh, cause the flagella to rotate clockwise so that the cell will uh, resulting in tumbling or the stop the movement. This chemotaxis Y protein is actually interacting with this receptor but once it is phosphorylated it will be uh, moving away from the receptor and it will uh, diffuse through the cytosol so that it will bind to the flagellar motor protein and allow the flagella to move in clockwise direction so that the cell will stop moving. Uh, if the cell will stop moving, obviously the tumble will uh, <clears throat> result, okay. 
So phosphorylated state of chemotaxis protein Y remains only uh, for a few seconds. Uh, then this will be removed. This phosphate will be removed by an another protein that is called Z. Okay, so this Z is a phosphatase. You can note it here. This chemotaxis Z is accelerating the dephosphorylation of this uh, response regulator. Okay, so that uh, that's how it is inactivating it. The binding of an attractant has an opposite effect. So uh, if the attractant will bind to it, so the cell will move in up towards the attractant and it will have some opposite effect. It inactivates the receptor. So if the receptor is inactivated, therefore there is a decrease in phosphorylation of this uh, sensor protein. If the sensor protein is having less phosphorylation and it will result in the less phosphorylation of the response regulated protein, which result in the counterclockwise flagellar rotation and the cell will run. Okay, so everything opposite will happen because the cell need to move in opposite direction. Okay, so because it will move towards the attractant and away from the repellent or toxin, therefore uh, the, in case of if there is a signal or there is a nutrient, so it will allow the cell so that uh, the receptor activity will be lowered. Okay. So that cell will, uh, the flagella will rotate counterclockwise and cell will run. So there is long runs. Each of the phosphorylator intermediates decayed in about 10 seconds. Now, again, in the previous discussion of networks, actually we had discussed about the time duration. Here also they are very important. So in about 10 seconds, the phosphorylator intermediates are over, okay? So this will allow the bacteria to respond very quickly when there is a change in its environment. So suppose there is a high concentration of nutrient or there is a toxin. So the bacteria will respond very quickly because in 10 seconds, this uh, phosphorylated intermediates are being degraded uh, okay, so by this phosphate-CHEZ protein. This is chemotaxis protein Z. The adaptation is mediated by covalent methylation. This we have already discussed. So if the methyl groups are added over the, cell, uh, over the receptor, this, these are undergoing the adaptation. A methyl transferase, which is an, another kind of protein that is called hemotaxis protein R. So this R is doing some kind of, uh, okay, so this we can remember as MTR. So this is for Mathura actually. So this uh, methylation is, or this methyl transferase activity. So methyl transferase is empty, is a result of this hemotaxis protein R. So this you can remember like this, okay. It is not a uh, uniform in all species of bacteria. It is, uh, this we are discussing in case of E. coli, but in gram-positive beta subtilis, for example, the attractant may stimulate and repellent may, uh, may inhibit the sensor activity. So opposite may also happen in some other species of bacteria, for example, in B. subtilis. So this you need to remember, but if you got the mechanism, you will not be confused by this particular statement. Now, uh, okay, so here actually this uh, beta subtilis uh, uh, is shown. Okay, so if there is a repellent or there is an attractant, so this attractant will inhibit the uh, sensor protein whereas repellent will, in, uh, will uh, stimulate the sensor protein normally so that the flagella uh, the move counterclockwise rotation or it will lead to the run. If it is moving clockwise rotation, it is going to tumble. Okay, so, and the functions of these chemotaxis proteins are given here. So A is a sensor, kinase, where the histidine is being phosphorylated. CHEW is an adapter protein, which is linking uh, this sensor with the receptor. Y is a response regulator, which is controlling the flagellar motor directly after phosphorylation over uh, aspartate residue. Z protein is an aspartate specific protein, phosphatase, uh, which will in, uh, remove this phosphate group from the CHEW, Y. And R is a methyl transferase, which is catalyzing a methylation of MCP so that the, it will undergo uh, some adaptation, okay? Then the last topic of today's class is quorum sensing. Now, what is quorum sensing? When the two bacteria want to talk to each other, this is called quorum sensing. So the term quorum sensing describes the bacterial communication phenomenon. Okay, so uh, actually what is happening if there is two bacteria, one is bacteria A, one is bacteria B. 
So this is bacterial communication phenomena is called quorum sensing that allow the bacteria to communicate with each other. So the bacteria are able to communicate, uh, able to say hi, hello to each other using these secreted signal molecules. These secreted signal molecules are of two types that I will show you through this particular diagram. Sorry, actually, I am not able to move the phase if I... So this is unifunctional, okay? So either I can edit it or either I can move it, okay? This is happening here. So first of all, in case of gram-negative bacteria, so the, we know gram-negative, gram-negative are generally more harmful than gram-positive because they are having some outer membrane, okay? So in gram-negative, actually there is two membranes. So uh, anyone can ask you this particular question. Actually, I was asked this question in one of the interviews. Uh, so uh, these gram-negative bacteria are having two membranes. One is outer membrane, one is plasma membrane. Whereas the gram-positive is having only one membrane, that is its plasma membrane. There are certain other differences also. For example, gram-positive is having frequent uh, peptidyl glycan cell wall, that is 20 to 70 nanometer thick, whereas this is having only thin peptidyl glycan layer, two to seven nanometer. But you need to remember these things. Uh, these are parts of discussion in microbiology, but I'm telling you here so that you are able to get at least something in this class. Okay, so, uh, so these peptide molecules or these molecules, signal molecules in gram negative because uh, they are hydrophobic in nature, so they can cross, they can go across the plasma membrane. As you can see, in case of gram-positive, they are not able to move through this plasma membrane because in gram-positive, they are different in nature, but they are drawn in a similar way. This is not correct, actually. These are different, these are different. So they are very specific to a specific uh, strain of bacteria or at least for gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, they are different, okay? so. Okay, now I will uh, like to tell you in gram negative, these are called AHLs, AHLs. What is AHL? So AHL is something, N-acyl homocerine lactones. So N-acyl homocerine lactones are the signaling molecules which are uh, able to cross the plasma membrane because of uh, they are having hydrophobic nature and will directly able to bind to some of the receptors which are called a ligand, ligand binding receptor, lugs R. Okay, so uh, after binding with the, the signaling molecules or AHL, they will directly controlling the gene expression because there is no nucleus in bacteria. So everything is happening in the cytosol only. Whereas in this particular case, these molecules are called as AIPs, AIPs. What is meaning of AIPs? If you say AIP or you say oligopeptides, it is not incorrect. Oligopeptides, P-E-P-T-I-D-S. So because they are having peptide in nature, they are not able to cross the plasma membrane. So there is some kind of sensor receptors over the membrane of gram-positive bacteria so that response regulator and sensor molecules can work in a coordinated way so that these response regulators are being phosphorylated over the aspartate residue as you know already this D. These aspartate will be phosphorylated and thus they are able to control the gene expression on the targeted genes in gram-positive bacteria. Now we will discuss what is actually happening now. At least you are able to understand these are AHLs, these are AIPs and actually what are AIPs? For my AIP are auto-inducing peptides. You can write here auto peptides. Whereas these are called N acyl homocerine lactates. Okay. So so this is so this we had discussed, the quorum sensing is kind of com bacterial communication uh, phenomena in which bacteria can say hi, hello to each other so that they can communicate uh, using some secreted signal molecules. These are AHL and AIPs in different type of bacteria uh, so that they can assess their population density. Now, this, this process uh, enables a population of bacteria to collectively regulate the gene expression. So the complete population, either it is gram-positive or gram-negative, 
uh, gram negative or gram positive, they are able to control or regulate their gene expression so that they can control their behavior because your behavior is as a result of the gene expressions, which kind of genes are expressing within your body so that your behavior is changed accordingly. In quorum sensing, bacteria assesses their population density by detecting the concentration of particular signal molecule that is called auto-inducer. So these round, round, gold, gold, these are auto-inducers. So these are AHLs or they are AIPs, they are called auto-inducers, which are correlated with the cell density. So jitne zada ye honge, uska matlab hai ki cells ki density utni hi zada hogi kisi medium mein, okay? So that's how bacteria is able to assess. Jaysa humare yaan pe kya hota hai, aadhar cards hote hai, waise hi bacteria ke paas, ye auto-inducers hote hai, with the help of which it is able to assess the density. Jitne bacteria, okay, hai medium mein. So this is actually written here, okay? So you can get this. Auto-inducers are represented by with the black dots which activate the transcription factors uh, by regulating the, the gene expression either by direct infections or by receptor mediated cascade directly in gram negative or receptor mediated cascade in case of gram positive. Now, current sensing is the regulation of gene expression in response to the fluctuations in cell population density. If there is a change in density of the population, generally when we incubate bacteria in a culture, there is a change in, uh, uh, so they are, uh, creating these kind of molecules so that uh, they, they can do quorum sensing, okay? So bacteria that use quorum sensing constantly producing and creating these certain molecules, these are called autoinducers. These bacteria also have the receptor for the autoinducers. So obviously if they are secreting something, they have the receptor so that they can sense these autoinducers. When the inducer bind to the receptor, it activates the transcription of the set of genes, uh, including those are responsible for synthesis of autoinducer itself, as we've seen from the feedback loop mechanism. The concentration of the autoinducer in surrounding medium depend upon the cell population density. As the bacterial population grows, the concentration of these in the surrounding medium will be increasing, uh, causing more autoinducer molecule to be synthesized and bind to the cell surfaces. The, det the, the detection of the minimal threshold stimulates the concentration of autoinducer lead to an alteration in the gene expression. So, if there is a minimal uh, threshold stimulatory concentration, the gene expression will be achieved. Both gram positive and gram negative bacteria use quorum sensing communication circuits to regulate their diverse area of physiological activities because the different genes are under uh, control of these uh, quorum sensing. These uh, processes include symbiosis, virulence, competence, conjugation, or the transfer of the plasmid between the two populations, uh, two uh, bacteria, antibiotic production, motility, or sporulation, whether it is anything. So this is under the control of quorum sensing. In general, gram negative bacteria use N-acetyl l homocysteine lactone that is called AHL as auto-inducer gram positive bacteria is having these oligopeptides or AIPs uh, used to communicate actually from each other. Now some examples are given here where they have discussed about these uh, receptors. This is inhibitory lux I. Uh, okay, so we we'll let us finish this. So one example, uh, the examples are given here. The first incidence of this biological phenomenon, this is called quorum sensing, came into the light when the discovery of luminescence produces by marrying bacteria Vibrio fischeri. So there is a bacteria Vibrio fischeri which is producing some of the luminescence, okay, some of the light will be produced. So these bacteria when free living in the seawater uh, at a lower cell density are non-luminescent. They are only luminescent, we are present in the high densities. However, when grow in the high cell density, they bioluminescence with a blue green light. So you can see a blue green light when there is high population density of these bacteria. This bacterium commonly forms symbiotic relationships with some of the fishes and some of the species of cichlids so that it can uh, protect itself from, uh, okay, from predators. These marine organisms carry a specialized organ called the light organ. So these marine organisms are having some specific organ with, in which it can form the symbiosis, which with bacteria luminescent appearance in a dark environment. So it will help that particular organism, which is having this light organ, so that the organism will appear uh, in the dark environment as due to the maintenance of high density of these uh, bacteria population in the light organs, okay. In the marine environment, uh, the bacteria only luminescence when colonizes to the light organs and do not emit light when it is a free living state. So remember when, because in the light organ, they are represented in high density, so they are, they are emitting this blue-green light. 
Whereas if they're present in the free living forms, so they are not having this particular living sense. Researches are going on over this particular uh, thing, particular bacteria, fishery, uh, regulate the bioliving sense, lead to the discovery of bacteria, quantum sensing via these AHLs. Okay, so because these are gram negative bacteria, so these uh, are the auto inducer molecules secreted by these bacteria. Synthesis of lipophilic, uh, because these are lipophilic, these can, these can traverse the plasma membrane, can go directly inside the cell. Catalyzes an enzyme called AHL synthase. Uh, it's the product of uh, the gene that is called Lux I gene. The Lux I gene is subject to positive autoregulation. That is the transcription of Lux I increases to the AHL accumulation in the cell. Now this is under the control of one gene that is called Lux I direct regulation. This is a stimulator of this particular so that it, it is a transcription is happening. So it will increase the concentration of these lactones so that uh, So uh, again, sorry, uh, there are some network issues. So again, I'm um, repeating this. Okay, so this AHL synthase is producing this particular uh, lipophilic molecule. This can go directly into the plasma membrane, through the plasma membrane, go inside the cytosol. And it is controlling this uh, Lux I gene. This Lux I gene, again, increasing the concentration of AHL in the cell so that it is accomplished through the transcriptional activator. The, the second uh, transcriptional activator is called Lux R. The two genes are working working in coordination so that they are increasing the concentration of N-acetyl homocysteine lactone so that they can uh, do quorum sensing. Thus, without AHL activated LUXR, the LUXI gene will be transcripted only at the basal level. So suppose if there is no AHL at all, so this quorum sensing is not happening. So the LUXI will be transcribed only at basal levels. What is the basal level of transcription? only the required amount of uh, AHL will be produced and there is no quorum sensing, there is no bioluminescence can be seen in the uh, population. So it is freely diffuses out of the cell because it is a, a hydrophobic molecule and accumulate in the environment where cell density increases. The concentration of AHL also increases in the uh, environment of these light organs greater the concentration of AHL flows back into the cell and activating high level of transcription of uh, uh, this gene Lux I, which is, uh, and other genes which are uh, the product of, uh, which are needed for these bioluminescence or for uh, creating these blue green lights. So the concentration and the transcription of those genes will be increased so that uh, uh, quorum sensing can happen in a more efficient way if there is high cell density. So in today's class, we have discussed quorum sensing. We have discussed two component system of bacteria, how the bacterial flagella uh, and what is the differences between bacterial and eukaryotic flagella, how these are regulated, what type of proteins are forming channels through which these uh, H positive ions are going and uh, controlling the movement of uh, the motor and, and bacteria. And also we have studied two types of movements. One is called run and one is called tumble. If the uh, flagella rotate counterclockwise, it is always run. Okay, so you need, you need to remember one. If you, need, if you remember one, the second is ultimately you need not remember. So if the bacterial flagella is rotating counterclockwise or anticlockwise, it will lead to the run. Okay. Second major thing in today's class, we have discussed about uh, the signaling networks, which are very complex in case of eukaryotes, but they are very simple in case of bacteria because they are very simple organisms. Okay, that's it for today. Actually, we have finished our class timely. And if you are having any doubts now, you can ask. Rishla, Priyanshi, Nidhi, Ankita, Amu. There are only five people in this class, so no problem at all. I know this is very complex and if you, you will not revise this today, uh, will not bring your queries. So ultimately it will be a major loss for you because the cell signaling is a major thing uh, in cell biology, which we should finish. Okay, so I have finished uh, this portion, both from the Pathfinder and from your book, reference book, Cooper. So now it's your moral responsibility to prove to find the queries and to revise this particular post.